industrial relations and human resources. That's right. And uh, we are very pleased to be here. Uh, Dr. Gomez has been a senior lecturer before now at the London School of Economics. He has had visiting posts in at the universities of Munich and Zurich and uh, Moscow. And he publishes and referees in international journals uh, he's won the John T. Dunlop Outstanding Scholar Award for Exceptional Contributions to International and Comparative Labor and Employment Research. It's like winning one of those McLean's rankings. <laughs> 50 of them. <laughs> and the McGraw-Hill Best Paper Award in Business Economics uh, at the Global Conference on Business and Economics in Oxford, or at Oxford, rather, in the UK. Uh, and that was with David Foote. So he's also the director and co-founder of Think Tank Toronto, which is a place here where uh, creative ideas are encouraged um, through the development and facilitation of projects with uh, the community to make all of what's available to the arts and social sciences available to everyone. So without further ado, I'd like to say welcome to Raphael and Okay, thank you very much, uh, Susan. Um, hope it's not much ado, but it's <laughs> quite an impressive introduction. Um, I should add that this presentation is uh, a co-authored piece of research with uh, a co-author here on my left, uh, Professor Morley Gunderson, and uh, graduate student Umar uh, Voodoo, who uh, I knew as an undergraduate student when I taught at Glendon, which is one of the places that was uh, missing from my my lengthy uh, bio. Um, so I was very fortunate to come in contact with great students um, like Umar uh, and Adam, who's also a gra former graduate of Glendon and whom I taught. So uh, quite nice to see. And Zion, <laughs> graduate of uh, the University of Toronto, Woodsworth College, the other place that I teach. It's very complicated, isn't it? Okay. So uh, the title of this talk is slightly different from the one I gave Susan many months ago now. Uh, titled it Relative Income, Mental Accounting, and the Life Satisfaction of Older Adults in Canada. You'll see that these things have a, a meaning and an explanation unto themselves. One of the things that I wanted to do today is also talk a little more broadly about happiness-related research, which has become very much a uh, hot button, hot buzz uh, topic amongst people. And there are controversial aspects about this research, I think. Uh, controversies too too big a word. There are um, opinions uh, on either side of the validity and value of this kind of research. So I thought we could talk about that. And also uh, the, our pension system and how we um, uh, derive income in our uh, older adult years and in our retirement years. That's also something that comes out of this talk. So I'll give you a presentation that very quickly, I hope, and sharply and focused tells you what we found in our work, and then after, I'm sure people here have lots to say about some of the issues that are, are brought up by this, this kind of work. So, um, what we're doing in this paper uh, is looking at two basic ideas, and I'm going to give you right up front what the findings of our work <coughs> tell us about these two ideas, and then as I said just a moment ago, we'll hopefully then engage in a bit of interesting conversation about happiness and well-being research generally, and also uh, have something to say about small differences that might make big uh, impacts in people's well-being. So if you buy into the whole premise that you can measure someone's well-being by questioning them or surveying them, then doing things that seemingly seem unproductive, inefficient, uh, and ha have very little value can actually hurt people's subjective well-being. And we have a patchwork quilt of income support payments once we retire. Some people have argued these are just historical uh, accidents. You know, these programs were instituted at different times, the old age security system, the guaranteed income supplement, the Canadian public pension plan. But we don't need to have this patchwork quilt. We can sort of subsume them in one um, uh, grant that we can give people, like Social Security in the US. But doing so, if you buy some of the findings of our research, might actually hurt people's sense of well-being and financial uh, well-being as well. So that's the premise that we're, we're going to look into. Well, so, yeah, 
and generally, as you can see from the title, what effects do income produce, different measures of income produce on people's subjective feeling of satisfaction with life or well-being generally. That's the, the main um, point. Okay, so I thought this is a lunchtime seminar, so maybe not about your lunch. We'll use food as the metaphor. Put yourself into a state of mind uh, of someone who likes bagels. Of course, Mon we're not in Montreal with the best bagels. <laughs> a couple of places in Toronto where you can get bagels like that. Um, and New York now, apparently, thanks to one of Morley's uh, younger sons who's brought the Montreal bagel to New York. More on that later. <laughs> you are someone who enjoys bagels. This is your bagel. How much do you enjoy eating it? Scale of one to ten. How much would you enjoy eating this bagel? If this was in front of you. Ten, right. Well, well that's hard because I, I can't make you like it more. Or maybe a bonus number. Yeah, pick a number. Whatever it is. This is your bagel. And it's got cream cheese in the middle. Classic combination. Now You've noticed to your right, someone has a larger version of the same bagel. <laughs> same quality. Baked in the same oven. Sant Aviatur in Montreal. And you've just seen that it's a bigger version of the same thing. How much do you enjoy <clears throat> your bagel now that you've seen this larger bagel? Do you enjoy your bagel any less? Rational economic theories, long trodden um, speech here, says no, you will not be affected by what others consume. Is a standard premise of consumer theory, right? Own, own consumption means you derive utility and benefits from what you consume, and you're free of envy from what others consume. Well, a litany and a whole host of research that's now finally accepted by economists says, no, what other people have affects your well-being. I always use this example of my students, right? You guys remember? If I said, um, if you get an A, will you, feel will you feel happy with that grade? People say, yes, yes. I told you the average was an A plus. <laughs> I'm not so happy. So, turns out research has shown that this is a big impact, has a big impact on your well-being. Robert Frank, he's a great popularizer of economic ideas, a great speaker. He had a book, a very prescient book, in 2000 called Luxury Fever, which he basically dissected the problem with the North American economy, and actually turned out much of the global economy built on credit, built on buying things. Why were we buying things? To keep up with the Joneses. This was very, um, lots of evidence even then that was showing people's consumption of luxury goods, high-priced wine bottles, watches, uh, was fueled by credit. And why was it being fueled? Why were people buying this? To maintain their relative um, status in society. But for younger students in university, you know, they don't quite get this. They're all living at a very tight margin, but I'm saying as soon as you've got some disposable income, your reference points change, and these things can consume you in the kind of societies we live. Very recently, just <coughs> last week, a study by out of the University of California <coughs> by David Picard and a whole host of other co-authors found that, like in Ontario, they've just uh, announced a sunshine law, um, meaning that public payroll employees now, their incomes are visible on a public website, but it just happened, so it wasn't kind of fully known where to find this information. So what they did is they randomly chose people from the University of California with an email <laughs> telling them that we now have your fellow colleagues' incomes and your income on a public website. It's available to you. Have a look. They followed up to see who looked. They followed up again to see if they found their colleagues' salaries. Before and after, they asked questions about your satisfaction with your job, your willingness to quit, all these things. So pre and post test, kind of quasi random experiment, and uh, they did find that those that had looked and found where they stood in the pecking order uh, were less happy than those who didn't get the email or hadn't looked at all or knew. Your relative standing seems to cause either distress or, or happiness, but we rarely are happy. You know why? This is a sociological phenomenon. Talcott Parsons talked about this. We rarely look down. We always look up. We never think of who is beneath. We always find that one other person who earns more or who has a better office. <coughs> Marley, don't ever just forget. I have a bigger office than Marley. <laughs> I, I have no explanation. <laughs> so <laughs> we always look up and never look down. So we're always perpetually feeling you know, somehow frustrated in our relative standing. Caveat here regarding comparison groups. You know, we don't. 
we're kind of smart as human, even though we have this sort of fault, this little failure that we're always somehow measuring ourselves up to someone else and, and causing some distress. Uh, we're also smart enough to look at the right comparison group. You know, we don't, I don't measure myself against uh, Bill Gates, right? he's the founder of Microsoft and he's earning billions. I suddenly don't feel less <laughs> valued as a, as a person. So we, we are smart enough to know and, and judge our comparison group. So when there's a comparison group and we feel we're, we're at the above average part portion of that comparison group, another feature of our behavioral, uh, behavioral consumer thinking is that we always think we're above average. You know, if you go into a class, every student thinks they're above average. Impossible, right? There's an average, which means there's below and above. So um, we, we do have this uh, mechanism, though, that allows us to compare ourselves to the right group. So um, that was one theme, OK? The idea of relative as opposed to absolute uh, gains uh, as being important in our happiness and well-being. Again, you're someone who enjoys bagels. Again, <laughs> this is your bagel. How satiated are you? It's a slightly different question. How satiated are you by this consumption, active consumption? Okay, I'll show you another picture to see what I'm getting at. You cut the bagel in half. This, I can, it's the same amount of cream cheese. You're not doubling up. It's the same amount that would have been squished between two. Now you've spread it over two separate pieces. You feel more satiated than the single bagel? Would you feel more satiated if you cut, cut up a sandwich in half, ate it, rather than eating it whole? It turns out you are, and it, there's a kind of a physiological thing. It slows down your eating, it gives you more chance for your tummy to tell your brain, hey, I'm full. But there's another thing. It's just the visualization of two versus one creates a sense of satiation in people's brains. And it applies to food as well as to money. People have done experiments. You give people coupons. Give someone a $10 coupon or give someone two $5 coupons at the same value, give them two versus one, they feel happier and richer with the two fives. Again, you can sort of say, well, five gives you more variety. You can use five one in another store. Yeah, that's part of it, but splitting up the gains in equivalent monetary values makes people feel better. I ran into this when I was uh, living in England. I, uh, I had a family who, who were living in a, a town north of London, and they had two young kids then. Now they've all grown up. One's going into teacher's college now, but at the time they were uh, 10 and I think 7. And I went up my first Christmas, and I brought gifts. Now the older one, I thought, well, I don't know what to get her. Pre, just a pre-tween girl. So I went to uh, a Paul Frank shop, you know, the silly monkey, and I, I was back then it was trendy. I got her a Paul Frank shirt, which was I, when I looked at the price, I was like ready to buy. I had a whole like, bag full of scarves, the thing, and the, the shirt was 40 pounds. And I put this back. So I ended up giving her a Paul Frank shirt worth about 40 pounds. And then for my little my little cousin, I went to uh, an HMV and found a real good deal on all these PlayStation games. This was the first version of PlayStation. They were like five pounds each. So I think I bought four or five games. Separated, so I still and that was like 25 pounds. So then I bought him a, a soccer shirt, one of his favorite teams I think, at the time, Manchester United. Beckham was playing for Manchester. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> and I got him a shirt, and the thing still was like 30 pounds, 35 pounds. So it was less, less value. I, I, I came to this uh, Christmas uh, weekend at my my cousin's, and you know, I put these packages under the tree, and I woke up, and I remember seeing them rip open these packages. My cousin. Older cousin opening first her shirt, the monkey. She didn't even know what the hell this was. <laughs> <laughs> My other little cousin ripping open these little gifts one by one, getting so happy and you know, happier. Ha as he got happier and happier, she got sadder. I was going to explain to her, the va you got more value. <laughs> collective value didn't matter. So we have an inbuilt, seemingly inbuilt mechanism that um, values uh, quantities that are split up. Marketers know this too, by the way. You get percentage discounts at stores. Why do you get percentage discounts, not dollar amounts? It's more work for the consumer. You've got to convert percentage to, to dollar. Well, it turns out mental accounting shows that when you've got a percentage discount, it gives you an independent benefit. Just the percentage itself, in addition to the dollar value. Um, I have someone here in the room who would drive 
half hour to get a 50% discount on a $10 item, but wouldn't to get the equivalent value of $5 on a, say, $1,000 item. In economic terms, that's irrational. $5 should be worth a half hour of your time, no matter where the discount's applied, but you only travel when it's a 50% discount, because you feel you've gotten the deal. It's an extra mental account that gives us benefits. It's, I can keep explaining it to people. It's irrational. Don't do it. You can't stop yourself. So yeah, this comes from a, a long list of uh, research studies. One in particular I really like. Every student here probably knows that taking my courses, I always reference Brian Wansink. Then all kinds of neat um, experiments with our uh, consumption of food together. And uh, so could the same phenomena exist in other areas of life? People have shown this over food, over things like our um, purchasing decisions. But it, it's something that's not as easily thought of in this way. Can it also be processed in the brain as being a multiple gain and thereby giving us uh, lots of value? So that's the question. And according to Richard Thaler, yes, he's actually found um, evidence in the so ex experiments in people, people have to get investment income drawn from a variety of sources. It's like an optimal amount. Three or four gives you the most benefit, even, even though the amounts would be the same. So one investment gives you a value. You split up those investments in three, and they give you the same value or even less. You're happier with the three. This is, I know, it's puzzling, but that's what happens. So I began to, th I, I had these things in the back of my mind because I'd been teaching them. And then simultaneously, in fact, not just teaching them, I I'd learned about these many, many years ago, way ahead of many other things to someone who's just walked through the room. <laughs> my professor, uh, Professor uh, Ian McDonald, like, told us about all these experiments that were happening in the late 80s, early 90s, far ahead of what's now become very common and current. So in any event, I, uh, I had these things in my mind and, great teaching tool, but didn't think I would ever apply them in a paper. Uh, two years ago, I was asked to do a report for uh, the government on OAS, OAS and GIS payments, so Old Age Security and Guaranteed, guaranteed Income Supplement pay, Payments. They wanted to know the financial well-being and the social well-being impact of these payments. That is, people who are in receipt of them, do they feel better than those who don't? And if they're seniors and retired, what effect do these programs have? Because I think they were doing what I was mentioning at the start, the review of why do we have all these systems? They're administered separately, that adds cost. Could we then avoid these costs and give people the same monetary amount, but without all these layers of complexity? So I, I just went ahead and tried to do a very straight ahead project um, in analyzing this kind of work. I used a general social survey, which is a survey I've always liked using because it even though it's cross-sectional, um, every five years they repeat more or less the same questionnaire, so you can go back and create kind of a synthetic panel and compare differences across the cohorts. It's also very nice because it's a social survey. They ask lots and lots of, statistically we say, right-hand variable questions, things like birth order, and how many siblings do you have alive, do you get along with them, how many people live in your house, what kind of relations do you have. Very nice uh, in that way to to have that kind of rich data. So as one of the tables, you can see it's really down on the list. I was doing a lot of these sensitivity analysis, breaking up the data and showing what happened, and I found this effect. So this is a very busy table. You don't have to sort of know stats or see what's going on. I'll, I'll just describe it for you. But what caught my eyes when I ran, so this was a, a regression, statistical regression, which I had a measure of financial well-being, like how financially secure and well off do you feel you are, um, was basically the question. I so it took, it was a scale, like one to five. So I took the top two codes and created a variable that said I'm financially well off if I'm satisfied or very satisfied. So about 20% of people in the sample were. These were 45 plus, and I think for this sample, only those that were retired. So when I, when I looked at, at people who were just in receipt of either of these didn't have didn't seem like there was any effect. The stars mean something significant. There's a significant effect on your well-being, financial well-being, if you have an OAS benefit payment or a GIS benefit payment. But when I, I took another variable which combined these two, just was accidental. 
things like what's your main source of income, and they combine OAS, OAS and GIS. So if you get both of these, there seems to be an effect. Now, the overall effect is driven by females, not males. So, but the combination was seemingly providing more benefit. These regressions are controlling for your income. So you don't see it here, but each one of these coefficients appears in a lengthier regression where you control for income. So this kind of caught my attention. And then I remember this research that I was teaching my students on multiple gains, you split them up, split up gains into multiple sections. You perceive them as being more valuable to give people a ten dollar coupon or two five dollars, they'll be happier with two five dollars. So I thought that's interesting. So if you're thinking of merging these programs, be aware that you might actually make people feel worse off, whether they really are, but that might be important. So I left it at that. I, uh, I didn't have the time, I think, to, to vote to this research. So uh, quite fortunately, I had uh, Umar, who uh, finished his undergraduate, started his graduate work, and was doing an econometric course, and needed a paper, needed a topic. And I just floated this idea. You know, I found this interesting result once in this report. I left it at that. What can we find from this? So we, we started looking a little bit more deeply then into the happiness research agenda. And all it boils down to really in more fancy forms than this, sometimes with a very detailed methodological uh, approaches like the card study where you know they randomly selected people to get information that others didn't. Those are research design questions that can get quite fancy so you can prove cause and effect, but ultimately they kind of end up estimating the same thing. A measure of well-being or happiness on the left-hand side against a whole set of predictors of this happiness. Not much more than that. Uh, ideally, you'd want data that picked up the same person over many periods, because their research has found people have natural set points of happiness, They're kind of fixed to the person. You'd like to control for those. For those. As I said, the absence of that is a good, rich, detailed study like the General Social Survey that gives you all those things that we normally say are fixed, but really they're all contextual. How many siblings do you have? And birth order, all these things might, might have potentially the small effect that you're having. So this is the general characteristic. Uh, things like religious attendance and so on, mar marriage or separated or single, never married. I'll get into that in a moment. <coughs> Our our measure of this left-hand side variable is this one, and I've made a mistake. I actually only code the fifth one in the results I'll show you, but we do sensitivity analysis that includes the top two codes and then allows this all to vary. But essentially, are you very satisfied, satisfied, dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied with your life in general? If there are more specific questions. There are questions to ask before and after retirement. To get at this question, like if you were dissatisfied before retirement, well, then this has less of a, you know, impact. But notwithstanding that, this is um, the results you're going to see in a moment. All are based on this question. So we created the economist variable to sort of predict the probability of being satisfied. I'm saying you're satisfied if you circle these two, and you're not if you circle these. So you test the sensitivity of this by looking only at that, and then seeing if it works, and then something called an ordered probe in which you look at everyone's responses, potential responses. Okay, so that's what we base our happiness index on, this question. Here's what we find when we just put in some standard variables. We did this so that we could figure out, is our sample, which we didn't think so, but is our sample way off the mark? Um, a lot of this, as I said, this research has not been done, so we know what to expect with age, uh, with gender, with religious attendance, which we have. <coughs> so we did just a simple regression without any of those income measures that test those two little theories I talked about, just to see a benchmark model. So here's what we find, and I'll summarize it in words if you're not comfortable with the uh, figures here on this table. But all they mean is you see a positive sign, it's, or you don't see a negative sign it's impacting person's perception of life satisfaction in a positive way. The brackets, the square brackets, are what the excluded reference category. Each regression coefficient, like a treatment and control, if you had an experimental design attached to this. But 
essentially what you find is that um, males are less happy than females. 65 plus are more happy than 45 to 64. Compared to single, actually that should be single, never married. So married, common law, are happiest. Uh, widow, divorce, separated, slightly happier. Education level seems to impact positive, especially university education, which is actually another recent finding that university is like an extra, kind of works monotonically until you get university and it spikes up. Something about going to university also seems to be doing something. Of course, these aren't causal models, but we can refer to them. Health, of course. So you might wonder, why would oh, we associate people 65 and over being less happy? Well, not really, actually. But even if you thought so, you might ascribe it to health. That's what happens when you control for health. So controlling for health, having a health, being in good health, you're going to be happier if you're 65 compared to 45. So health is a huge effect. And then this one that's come from a long list of uh, other surveys about people who are attending religious service most frequently, once a month or once a week, seem to be the happiest as well. Okay, so um, this is just in words. I did put one thing up. This is just in words repeating what we saw on the table. I did put one figure because it's, it adds a long list of rows to a table and Morley's very picky about not having tables that run over two pages, so <laughs> make it one page. I left out this, said we controlled for it. In Canada, there's lots of variation across province in terms of happiness. There's no which province is the happiest. Prince Edward Island. Prince Edward Island, it's a good guess. It's nice and small. Columbia. British Columbia, nice weather. <laughs> well, can't be good. Was that Newfoundland? I thought Newfoundland. Newfoundland's close. Um, we, we do these regressions and we leave Ontario out. So really, it's who ha who's happiest relative to Ontario. Um, but actually, the happiest was, oops, what happened? There we go. Was Quebec. Ireland. Yeah. So when, yeah, amongst the non-retired, retired not so great. This is still significant, but 2% Tinge points more likely to be satisfied, which is 10% effect. Remember the average um, was 20%. So these are pretty big effects given the mean <coughs> and overall satisfaction of people. The so Quebecers generally are, are happy. And uh, I kind of did a rough back of the envelope calcul calculation. If you buy these numbers, you basically have 125,000 more happy people in Quebec than in Ontario. <laughs> Um, one thing I wanted to show you as well, the age effect. We're picking up this right censored screen. This, these are from uh, Gallup polls of the US that have been done over many years. You can barely notice, but one line is with controls. So this is the effect of age, the relation to age and enjoyment, age and happiness based on Gallup poll questions in the United States. So we have a, a sample of 45 and over. Uh, they basic one of the regularities in the statistical happiness literature is that it's a double hump shape to general enjoyment and well-being. And that is that kind of you're happy in your, your teens and in early 20s, and then you kind of fall gradually uh, into your 30s and, and mid 40s. Combined pressures of childcare, career, and work, and mortgage payment. I guess these things are ascribed as the reasons, and then. Picks up again in a slight dip, but never coming down to these low plummeting levels. I guess the midlife crisis zone, you know, statistically observed in this data. But we we have a sample of only these folks, so you can see the app why the average for 65 plus is higher than the 45. So it's it's uh, interesting. This shows up in, in other surveys and in statistical regularities found in other papers. It's a very interesting paper, by the way, if you want to know put a link to it if you guys want to see it. Okay, so <coughs> this is too busy. I, I'm not going to show you these numbers, uh, but when this uh, estimate was done, pooled, we have 45 plus population. We know there are retirees and non-retirees in the sample. So we, we separated those and looked at whether there were big differences. There are only two differences amongst the retirees. It's age and gender. Um, 
turns out the effect of age reverses itself for the retired, in that older retirees are less satisfied than younger retirees. Presumably, you know, it's it's choice, and yeah, it's one one reason. But if you're retiring below before 65, it's probably voluntary. Especially in this sample period, there was still mandatory retirement in our in our sample. A large large number of them driven by Ontario, which still had mandatory retirement. So that, that's one reason, but you might have your own thoughts as to why that is. The other is that gender for the pool sample is actually entirely driven by the retired subpopulation, while the marital status affects the positive. The married is driven mostly by the non-retired sample. What I mean by that is that uh, this coefficient is being driven by that effect for the non-retired, less so for the retired, although they both work in the same direction at least. Whereas here, you know, they flip signs. <coughs> so here they flip signs. Here it's a much stronger effect by the retirees. Female retired people are happier than male retired people. That's what that's. Okay. Um, and these are just points found in other similar type studies. Uh, if you can get a, a, at a latent measure, Feeling in control of one's life increases your happiness. Um, obviously, if you've lost your job involuntarily, that decreases your happiness. Um, yeah, children tend to do that. <laughs> but again, this is, one, this is one of the problems of statistical research. If they were really causing unhappiness, we wouldn't have any. Right? That's the economist. Right, so there's something we're, we're subjectively feeling at a deeper level that's harder to articulate in the survey. Uh, or this whole room would be empty. A few of the last people who had children 30 years ago before we found out about happiness. <laughs> um, the amount of spare time people have, again, but that's discretion. You know, if you have discretion and you can choose your time. Social status, if you can control for that, tends to wipe out income, which we'll see in a moment. So these are just general findings. So we, we, we think our data is pretty close. So now, on to what we're going to show you, the big kind of two ideas that we're going to look at. Actually, we'll include three. Does the absolute size of the bagel matter? That is, when you had the bagel in front of you, having a bigger bagel makes you happier? It should, in theory. It's not too big. And what we mean by this, do persons with greater household income also display greater life satisfaction? Second, does the relative size of the bagel matter? Meaning, do persons with greater income relative to the median for their age, province, and gender? And something uh, Umar did to go out of time to find that, but that's a, a really good uh, measure. It's, Times to standardize, not to pick out a random number, but to find your um, comparison group. It's, it's a rough measure. It's not perfect. The card study is great because they're actually telling people who in your department earns what. I mean, that's that's really the right comparison group. But here we have a statistical comparison group. So it's your income relative to um, people who are the same age, live in the same province, and the same gender as you. Is that do you display greater or less life satisfaction depending on how big your relative income is? And then finally, does the number of bagel slices matter? Uh, do more sources of income increase your life satisfaction? <coughs> controlling for the absolute income and also the relative income. So that's what we're going to look at. These are the results pooled. I won't bore you by going through each of these numbers. I've graphed these or attempted to graph them. Let's start then with this first column, which has all those controls I showed you before for religious attendance, for marriage, for gender, etc., and now adds household income. This is what happens with no controls other than household income. No, no income controls, I should say. You get, you get a boost of about 4.3 percentage points uh, in your life satisfaction. And I think the mean, I should have put here, Marley, oh, yes, I do. Top well. So that's the base, right? 31% of people are very satisfied with life. So this is four percentage points of that. So roughly, who can do quick math? Co-authors, what percent <laughs> increase? About 10, just over 10%, 12% effect. So not bad, except disappears when I control for relative income and when I control for source of income. Meaning your absolute income really isn't the thing that makes you happy seemingly, in the pooled sample. That is, people above 45, their absolute income seemingly has an effect. Not really. It's relative income. 
destroys or wipes away the effect of this, as does the sources of income mm -hmm. that you earn. Everyone follow? Even if you don't know the numbers too much, just see these graphs declining and diminishing in significance. Stars indicate uh, significance of 1% for 3, 2 is 5, and 1 is 10%. Uh, Everyone comfortable then? So we actually <coughs> find support for, if you think about this as also being a control for your status, your social status, that's in line with what previous research has found. That if you have a measure of social status, your income stops mattering. Um, but what happens to the retirees, retirees and what happens to the retirees and non-retired in our sample? This is interesting. Well, these three are the same um, that we saw here. Only now I've split them by retired and non-retired. So you can see the effect is the same as with the overall. We get no effect at all. But the retired still value the absolute size of the, they're more rational. They value the absolute size of their bagel. Half, it's about half, but it's still significant. So it went from 5%, I think, nope, under, just under 5%, 4.9, to about 2.5. So this is with relative income and uh, sources of income. Why, why do you think that is? What, what hints or what have we seen from a little bit of theory that we talked about or mechanisms, social mechanisms, might explain these results? Never a concrete answer because you're dealing with cross-sectional work and you ascribe these attributes or you ascribe these mechanisms. But I think there's one explanation that ties in quite nicely. If you could look at the card study, they told people to look at your fellow workers, right? <laughs> look around your workplace. These people aren't in a workplace to look around. They're in a neighborhood where you know the next retired person maybe three houses down. You don't know how much they're earning. It doesn't matter. So you've lost your pressure, the social comparison pressure, which could be one of the mechanisms explaining why people are seemingly happier in early retirement. Uh, you've lost this keeping up with the Joneses uh, effect, uh, in effect. Do you buy that argument? Could be. There could be other reasons. But statistically, these things are pretty, pretty strong and robust to uh, the controls that we've added. Okay. Um, but the title of this slide shows relative income does matter more. Um, let's look. So, should have had the overall one. Yes. So this is the overall estimate. No, oh, no, no. This is right. I'm very sorry. <coughs> yeah, I thought I'd show you the split. Okay. So if we go back to the table, very, very busy table. This is a measure of relative income. Let me just what it is. Marty can help if I push this. But, uh, based on who, your age, your gender, and where you live, you have a predicted median income. The actual income that's listed on the survey either it is in or around this medium level or is above or below. So if you're one standard deviation below, you're here, below the median. If you're one standard deviation above, you're above. If you're two standard deviations above, you're well above. Something to that effect? So we created a, a, a category variable here. Because we thought there's be non-linearities perhaps, but uh, you see that the further away in a positive direction from the median income, the happier you are using happiness to question life satisfaction. But the more satisfied you are with life in, in this column. This is both retirees and non-retirees. We want to know, is this effect greater or weaker if you split these two groups up. We would think it's weaker amongst retirees just because the absolute income was stronger. Right? The fact that you put in relative income didn't wipe out the absolute income. It's consistently uh, significant across groups. So that's what we thought. Let's look at a graph because you can see this better. So remember, these are all relative to below the median. So you're, you're kind of just above one percentage point happier, equal, or just over two above and close to six or seven, well above. This is for the retired sample. Mm -hmm. Note that it has not, no effect. You really have to be kind of super rich in your retired age to have any effect. The rest of the time, it doesn't matter. But for the non-retired, it matters, and it matters in an increasing fashion. 
well above the median, you're 10 percentage points. That's quite a bit. That's 30%. It's about 30% effect because the overall satisfaction was 31 percent, percent, percentage points. Um, so there, there is a, a heterogeneity here amongst retirees and non-retirees. Uh, and again, we would use the kind of story uh, that we weaved before about social comparisons and the pressure to keep up being less for, for this group, not so for this group. Oh, and by the way, there are actually four lines here, but you can see that sources of income is a mar it's not a huge effect. It's going to be very marginal. Um, there's actually four lines because we do this with controls for multiple sources of income and without. You can barely see the difference, right? <clears throat> so yeah, there's some literature even going back almost 20 years now, I believe, uh, about this industrial politics. Uh, reference group mattering. Um, but remember, our absolute income is more meaningful for retirees, and quite rational then. Um, OK. So this is just in words what we, what we mentioned before. Having daily and tangible income and status comparisons creates sometimes a sense of uh, unease. It'd be a good experiment, actually, to do in Ontario. Every year, the uh, Sunshine Law comes out and publishes its list. It's right around that time that people go to look. You can kind of measure their general satisfaction before, you know, several times, and then a day or a week after that, I'm sure you find differences. There's someone who, who remained nameless that walks into Morley's office every time these numbers <laughs> come up and shows them who's right. <laughs> so I don't know, we could, uh, we could speculate. But I think that's pretty much a, uh, a strong effect when that is consistent with some theory. So now we're looking at the bagel that's sliced in half. You're eating two. Two slices of the same bagel. So it's the same amount, but you've split it up. So here's income. And remember, we're controlling for your actual income. We're controlling now for your relative income. What happens when you get more sources? Um, this is the pool estimates, both retirees and non-retired. Significance across all. Uh, obviously, do I have this right? This is uh, there's a, a wrong labeling here. This is actually two, three, four, five, six plus. You might say six plus. Who has six plus um, sources of income? Um, at the end of this, well, I'm sure I race to it, but there are actually 11 items, 11 sources of income uh, in the uh, StatsCan questionnaire. So there's actually a, a significant number of people who have six plus. There's some rental income, those three sources potentially of wage <coughs> benefits. Interest income, private pension income, they add up. Uh, so you do have a, a, a portion of people there. So splitting up gains seemingly has an effect, makes you happier, which kind of made a policy question. You know, if you gain efficiencies in one end by subsuming this patchwork of uh, retirement benefits, do you actually end up making people feel like they've gotten less? In which case, politically, you think twice about doing something like that. Um, when we split this, you can see it's driven entirely by the retirees. So that effect is pooled. It's really being driven by the retired population. So where they were rational in feeling good about the absolute size of the bagel, they're irrational when you slice their bagel. So the non-retired sample is, quote unquote, more rational, more economically rational. They're not fooled by the multiple sources. They're not as interested in it. One argument is you're, you're gaining security. Uh, you're diversifying risk. One source of payment, you know, it's a mistake, a glitch in the system. You don't get your payment one month. So there's actually a rational underpinning maybe to this as well. So those were the uh, findings. Remember I told you we had these two ideas we wanted to test um, from this burgeoning literature on, on uh, mental accounting and quasi-rational behavior, sometimes called. We found a, a, a group that you we originally would not have thought to have been amenable to testing those kind of general propositions about consumer theory, uh, and yet seemingly works, which is kind of nice. That's a nice academic um, aspect to the research. But I think in a broader sense, this op then opens up questions about what are we really measuring? How important is it to base the policy on questionnaires of this kind? Also raises questions about uh, how we distribute money to people and thinking through the implications of our 
our true well-being as opposed to just our financial or monetary um, absolute well-being. I think that's what this research uh, does. If you guys are statistically minded and, and want to know a bit more, uh, we have done some sensitivity analysis. So you might say it's wrong to collapse a measure. You're, you're eliminating a lot of the variation of people's gradation of, of well-being. So um, Umar also did an ordered probit. It's harder to interpret these numbers. I still have trouble. But I, I do know that they're significant and in line um, both in magnitude with the um, probability estimates we did. So this just allows the fact that people can score the variable 1 to 5 and, and then see that people are um, uh, responding in the way you, you thought with uh, these categories, these categories here. So that's the, the results from, from that estimate. We also do a set of interaction effects, which the retirees uh, enter as a dummy. So you're, you're you're interacting to see if there are significant differences in these lines. So I mean, you can compare the coefficients and, and do some things. But it's a better test to see if these lines are really different, okay, are they statistically different? And they turn out to be different. Um, these, all the interaction effects turn out to be significant. Basically, you see that um, household income there's no effect from household income other than the interaction effect. Right? The, it's negative for the pool, but it's because it's driven by this positive result of retirees. That's just an example. So the, these are the interaction of being retired and the multiple sources, the relative income and the household income. These are transformed into continuous variables. We, do this. We, we don't do it. We get rid of those categories. So that some people say that's a better way of estimating a variable in a continuous fashion rather than just uh, in a category. So um, other things you could do with this kind of work, obviously, is uh, split the samples by male and female. There's uh, a long tradition in labor economics to, to do that. It's also, we can split this sample by age, not by retirement or non-retired, but by age category. We did see early on from this figure of US uh, respondents, in fact, generally by many, that there are these differences, even this you know, dip in this age category would um, maybe show up better if we split the sample into one, two, three groups. So those things can be done. Um, what I'm left with then is just a series of, I think, deeper questions. After summarizing the, the main the main findings that relative income matters more than absolute income, wipes it away for the pooled sample, wipes it away for the non-retired. Still significant though for retirees, um, but uh, and the sources of income seem to matter for retirees, but not for the non-retired. I think more deeply, uh, we probably learned that our parents used to say, or advice that was given, uh, money doesn't make you happier necessarily. Uh, what does matter seemingly in our societies is the pressure to be part of a uh, system in which your status is somehow pegged to your earnings, whether we like it or not. Whenever we look at those lists of published salaries, it affects us. And we don't want to be affected, but it's that um, intrinsic effect, I guess, that's, that's, that's popping up. It's hard for us to, to step aside from that. Unless we're outside of that environment, and the retired are like that treatment group that steps out of that social comparison uh, pressure cooker and, and seemingly enjoys life more uh, as a result. Um, but there's subtle interest and very interesting questions that can never be answered by research like this. And I came across this because when I was preparing for, for the lecture and I was coming here to the, to the institute, uh, I wanted to, to inform myself of all the kind of aging research and gerontological research that's been done. And there's some really interesting stuff, at least from my perspective. To some of you, it's, it's probably second nature, but the work done in sociology and social psychology in the 60s, 70s, early 80s, looking to people, and small samples of people, maybe a couple hundred, but over very long trajectories. Uh, one study, the Grant study, you ever heard of this one? It was on the cover of The Atlantic last year. Since 1937, they've been following a group of Harvard graduates. They're all in their 80s now. It's fascinating. And you get 286 sort of case histories. Very subtle and deeper points about 
the life course and well-being uh, emerge from this kind of analysis. And I think it would be great if somehow these things could merge. Uh, I don't know quite how, but after your statistical uh, agenda of the sort of predicting who's happy based on observable characteristics could be informed by this and vice versa. Uh, maybe more subtle questions that are asked on these big surveys, or multiple survey questions, would help us um, validate what's been found in these small samples. But, but really fascinating stuff. These were actually the records that go back uh, almost 80 years, 70 years now. Um, they're on this big vault in, in Harvard. And one prof who's just retired sort of handed over, and then George Valiant handed over the records to a, a new generation. Um, but you know, the stuff that was found back then has been found in, in modern research that uses surveys, larger data sets, like regular. This is funny, because you have this long, longitudinal thing. Regular exercise in college predicted late life mental health better than it did physical health. It, this, even if you stopped going to the gym later, but the fact you went in college. Um, so depression turned out to be a major drain on physical health. Pessimists seem to suffer physically in comparison with optimists. Um, power of relationships. So men's relationships at age 47 predicted late life adjustment better than any other available. And there, this aspect of mental adaptations and defenses um, comes from uh, psychology. Uh, but it's, it's a very interesting. Good sibling relationships seem especially powerful. 93% of men who were driving age 65 and close to a brother or sister when younger. You can be separated for many years, but in fact, you were close when you were younger, uh, has this mental defense uh, later in life. So, I mean, you can think about questions like this, subtle ones asked in these general surveys, uh, that could inform you. It wouldn't be as valuable as these longitudinal sets, data sets that get the same person over many time, many time periods, but I think still, still useful. So these are just more details about that kind of research agenda, which I found fascinating. Again, I'm new to it, so it just sort of popped in my brain. It's amazing. Some of you probably are well aware of these kind of, of, of studies. Um, so, uh, oh yeah, I want to leave you with this question. So, in light of what I saw, I found this is paradoxical, and it came from that same article. Danes are like the happiest people. Like when they do these cross-national uh, world value surveys on happiness, the Danes are like the happiest. But if you just saw pessimists are less happy than often. Well, this is like the most pessimistic people. When they ask questions, <laughs> is the future going to be worse than the present? They say yes, it's going to be worse. <laughs> so what, why is that happening? What is this? Are we contradicting ourselves? Maybe not. I think you look deeper. It turns out the, the joys of life come from unexpected uh, events. And when you think the future is going to be worse than the present, it turns out not to be, you become happier. <laughs> so your expectations are properly, you know, adjusted. Uh, but you know, another feature of Denmark: very low income inequality. So mm. high standard of living, very low income inequality. Mm. Um, so who knows? We we can maybe gather a whole series of uh, insights from our micro data, our regressions and estimates of these surveys, data drawn from these small samples over long periods to make inferences about these big picture differences that we find across the world. So uh, with that, I will end my formal talk, formal portion, and I'll invite any questions or comments or thoughts. Yeah. Yes? Um, so first of all, uh, both of you rationally dealt uh, yes. the about the size of the bagel. I'm yeah. thinking maybe it's, it has to be too large to secure the other sources. So when I have more sources, I, I feel more secure that if one of them stops paying me, then I have other sources. So it's just I agree. There is. There's definitely a rational underpinning to that, um, except except if you I mean, they think one step further, but rational. I mean, is the government going to default on my checks? Is uh, is room? You know, are my interest payments from my bank? Yeah, I agree. I think there's a, a, a logical argument, sort of variety, spreading risk, risk spreading that comes from this, um, definitely. And uh, I, but you can see it. The difference across retired and unretired, though, is interesting. Because you're, you're not working, you've lost the principal source of income. Yeah, and then now having on those exactly, so I, I would agree. I, I was pushing the it's an easier sell. It makes it a funner, more fun, enjoyable paper to talk about if you couch it in these neat uh, consumer behavior models. But so I still uh, like the other there's something there. I, I think it's partly rational, partly something yeah. rational. Yeah. Well, 
one more thing is that um, is there anything that you can do? I'm not sure uh, what kind of data you're using. Is it a panel or is it cross section? Awesome. If you can do anything with the identification, like just maybe hack your people. They are the type of people which go for more slices of bagel instead <laughs> of more slices of bagel or making them happier. Yeah, the the clever thing to do would be to search out it's where maybe Umar's work will happen in his graduate. I'm sorry for it. Yeah, <laughs> it would be a search out. This is a cross-sectional data set. And uh, yeah, you could search out this data for a nice instrument that would predict uh, your choice of variety, but not correlate with your happiness. Um, there could be one there. That's a nice exercise to think cleverly. In these data sets, the nice thing about the GSS, not panel, but lengthy, deep. <coughs> There's probably an item or set of items that could be nice to add, you add that feature to show causality. But I wasn't too interested in causality. I wanted to show the relationship and then play around with the attributions. And then if someone argued that this was the connection, I'd be as happy, yeah, right? Because it's an That's interesting finding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes? I just wanted to make sure I got your drift when you're talking yeah. about retired people acting more rationally when it came to absolute income. OK, yeah. Because uh, I thought I heard two competing interpretations. One was that they were less subject to social pressures, like being compared to other yeah. similarly yeah. situated people. Yeah. And the second was that their age gave them the perspective that allowed them to uh, yeah. go get above that. Or, yeah. So which one do you think is more responsible for their happiness? I, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, how would we statistically uh, determine which is the driver, I don't know. Uh, there are actually, in this survey, people who have retired but gone back to work, hmm. or formally retired and entered back. That might be the group that you test this with. Hmm. Um, I'm just thinking it off the top of my head. The problem with that is that most who go back to work don't go back for the money. Yeah. They're for that benchmark comparison group. But, but it's still, they weren't checking on yeah, Go yeah. back to keep this here occupied. Right, but, and then, but they, the nice thing about the GSS, it asks you why you went back. How real, you know, you're kind of ascribing your reason, and you might have a, a reason you weren't conscious of. But yeah, that that would be a good uh, thing to do. It's a good question. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I came in late, so you okay. may have answered this. But in terms of relative yeah. income, what yeah. was defining relative? Good. Yeah, uh, we took a measure that based it on age, uh, province and residence, and gender. So it's not perfect. It's crude, I guess, but it's better than. So it wasn't people in your field. No, or in your no, we don't have that oh, specificity. Okay. The fact, but the, that's a good question because the fact that we find anything with that measure, mm -hmm. the theory would say if we had a better measure, a more precise measure of who your true comparison group is. So say it again, province. The province, gender, and age. I mean, we could have added marital status. No. I'm sorry, he did more work for him. I guess we could have added a few other determinants of. Uh, the median income, but uh, if you find anything with a measure like this, then you're at least on the right track, I think. The, you don't know if you came earlier, but there's a study that just came out that looked really precisely at your comparison group. It was university faculty at the University of California. Right. Yeah. You, you saw that? Well, yeah, I heard you mentioning it. To me, right. that seems like exactly. very targeted. Very. Because also, would different professions have more or less concern with relative income. Yeah, I would I would think so. Yeah. yeah. There is occupation in GSS. There so is. They, we could do something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do these estimates by occupation. And you'd expect stronger effects for you know, lawyers, mm -hmm. business services, mm -hmm. consulting versus um, give me another <laughs> teachers. Non non nonprofit manager. Nonprofit manager. <laughs> <laughs> good, good point. Yes. Yes. That's a good that's a good suggestion. Professor, I should know this. Yeah. Oh, was there someone behind? Yes. Oh, I'll ask you. I was going to say, was belief system a component of the study? Belief system? Yeah. No, we had religious attendance, a very, again, crude measure, but it's just sort of picking up, I guess, your your religiosity. So the frequency of attendance. Um, I think the GSS, though, has some deeper questions about that, potentially. But I agree that's another interesting area and aspect. Um, but it's sometimes it doesn't go uh, yeah. in the same direction with income. You're going to have less income than we have. Yeah. And more income than we have. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would agree. Yeah, 
and that, that's the benefit of uh, a panel. Yeah. Whatever those things are, we don't know, but at least we know we're picking them up when we have the same person observed over many times. Um, and the other thing that we were saying, contextual. Yeah. The environment, uh, the globalization of the society. That's true. Like that. Yeah. So it might be in a society as Canada, it might be that income is you know, safe and everything like that. But once a war happens <laughs> somewhere else, you know, yeah. income doesn't play that much role. Yeah, just but survival would. Yeah. Your uh, hierarchy of needs kick in. Uh, definitely. Yeah, I think mean, that's a valuable uh, comment. Yeah. Yeah. Did you exclude women who had not had a group outside the workplace of the retired group? Ooh, that's a good question. Did we exclude women who had not had a career from our retired group? It's actually a difference going to happen with yeah. those that are yeah, yeah. myself who have had an income and yeah. those who have never be nice. had a full income. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how large a proportion in our sample they are, but I do know they're there. I constitute in this cohort probably about thirty percent. Yeah, the female. So that's a big group. Uh, a size of the group. It'd be, be good to do a subsample of that. I agree. Um, and in fact, have a working category. Getting back to the question about your occupation. What 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 is your occupation? What was your occupation? You never had one. You never worked. So you can compare it across those categories. I think that's a good one. Oh, but we did have a, a group of single, never married, um, single, never married, not by women or men, but that would be another interesting um, group analyzing them. The married group, which presumably some of many of those would also not have had a, uh, a career, a paid career. They did have careers, but not <laughs> formal paid work. Um, yeah. When you look on the effect of the, the income, yeah. did you control by hair status? Uh, the head of household status? Yeah, no, it's no. the health statement. Health, health yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's very strong effects with health. Let me show you. In fact, the strongest ones are driven by health. So all of those things I showed you later had these as controls, but I, I didn't put them in the tables. They're just there as controls. Yes, health is really big. Yeah. Self-perceived, but still that, that matters, right? If you perceive your health as being good, it's going to be a good benchmark or predictor of your life satisfaction. Don't forget those yeah. very poor health are probably dropped out of the sample. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Very true. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. This, this I should know this, but is there a way of getting a handle on the asymmetry that you talked about that was in Card's thing? In other words, as you know, when, the, when as we fondly call it, the pigs list when it comes out, say the salaries, the salaries of our colleagues and that sort of thing, yeah. uh, we, what we do is we look at it and we really get annoyed and pay attention to those who are paid above us yes. who we don't think are any better than us. We completely dismiss those who are paid less than us who are as good if not better than us. That's right. <laughs> asymmetry in our comparison groups that we choose to, we call, to label the pigs, we always look up. Is there a way, instead of using the two, the standard deviations around the median, of getting a handle on the importance of, you know, the numbers of yeah. those comparators and that yeah. way to do an analysis that would capture the asymmetrical reference group that one's paying attention to that would weight them differently? Yeah, uh, thinking off the top of my head, there are some provinces, that's the right answer, some provinces where we know income inequality is less. Um, maybe that I was thinking more of using that standard deviation measure okay. around, was it standard deviation around the median? Yeah. Because that's then just saying either way it weighted equally. Oh, I see. Is there okay. a way of doing something, some asymmetric measure that weights the, the pigs more heavily oh, yeah. that are overpaid about us? Okay. I, I, I don't know. It's think, worth the mark thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> and doing about? Yes, and doing about. That's right. Right. No, you and I thinking about it. And doing about That's right. It. <laughs> Perfect. We got to keep it happy. <laughs> <laughs> keep us so busy, you can't be. Right. 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 Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah. And when you're comparing the people who had OAS and, I'm sorry, the name of the other GIS. GIS. GIS versus those who've been just getting one. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, one pardon? One or the other. One yeah. or the other. So I'm wondering, uh, does that 
somehow account for the fact that OIS and JS recipients are just getting more absolute income than no, not people just no, get more? No, usually means less. Right. They get the low, they're, they're getting a, a, a guaranteed income supplement because they're, they're actually so low. But oh, here, here's, okay. here's one idea I had, actually. This is good. I put it in a footnote. I always put footnotes in to remind me of future work. <laughs> so I said, who's going to be happier? Uh, the person who leaves a really high paying, nice job salary and goes to retirement, or the person who's had a pretty crummy job and only has a small step to go to retirement. Mm. I, th I, I, I put that into the report for the government. They didn't care about that stuff. Uh, but it's just so that I would do that kind of work. I have, we haven't done it here because uh, we were kind of focused on these tests of these two curious mental accounting models. But that would be a nice way of capturing what you were kind of uh, talking about, even though in this case it's the opposite. The OAS GIS people are actually earning less. But, but you're right. It's, it's an interesting experiment of kind. What happens to people who retire from really good paying jobs and high status and suddenly go to this low status versus someone who's not been there and therefore doesn't have as, uh, a far, as far to fall. So, does that already group those people that way? You can't. Yeah, the G yeah, the GSS does ask people what your former job was, yeah. questions about your occupation. I think there's a socioeconomic status variable there. That would be interesting, definitely. Yeah? Hi, there's a question from an outline member. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Andrew's question is, are you They didn't tweet, did they? I don't know. <laughs> It's through an online chat system. Oh, okay. So, um, so his question is: Are your research findings amenable to the current models that we suggest in health? Um, for example, Winkinson and Margot's Margot's uh, social determinant models. So it kind of links back to what he was saying. Is that right? Um, can you can you maybe phrase it in a way that I? Well, I, I don't know those models. Understanding yeah. I think that um, he's basically asking if this. Uh, matches some of the research done regarding stress and health? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, part of the reason you get the uh, difference across <laughs> the 45 plus, uh, especially the result where retirees, the, the sign flips. So if you're retired, but you're between 45 and 64, you're happier than the 45 and 60 year olds who are working. Presumably that <laughs> lack of stress on the job is, is going to be one factor you down. But the other thing, you know, jobs also provide, and this comes from a long literature of uh, the sociology research, and jobs also provide the uh, social environment too for many people. And if it's a pleasurable job, you kind of decrease the stress, which is a good thing, but you also decrease the social uh, attachments and, and the intrinsic worth of your work. So which one dominates is, is, un is unclear, right? But uh, I, I would say stress increasingly has become bigger because of the demands placed on people, like collar jobs, where once we had three people doing the work of one, uh, now it's it increased the stress and the demands of work today probably, um, although physically less onerous, are mentally perhaps more so. And you carry the work with you. If there's no blur between the work you did at work, they shut the door and went home, you've got the Blackberry, you've got your computer linked up when you get home. So work travels with you. So I think diminish, getting rid of that stress is a big Virtue. Thank you to the Twitter blog. Thanks, Ian. So, um, in the in my course on the sociology of mental health, actually, oh, yeah. uh, we were discussing how even though the middle age group has the lowest level of depression, yeah. um, the aging group actually has the lowest level of anxiety oh, and yeah. Um, yeah, anxiety and anger. So maybe there's a relationship there that. Yeah. It's worth looking into. Yeah, Robert Frank talked about like yes. the luxury, the anxiety about things that shouldn't bother. And you consciously are aware of these things. It should not bother me that you know, my neighbor has a better lawnmower or a better car or a nice garage. It shouldn't. In fact, it does. It nags at you. So you, you, you lose that anxiety uh, in, in a different uh, status, non-work. Non kind of reduces that pressure. Just to further to that yeah. uh, the point, um, yeah. uh, I, I think it is valid to say on the, the stress literature type stuff, yeah. we probably have to worry about a bit more. In other yeah. words, the possibility of a reverse causality was raised earlier uh, in there. Right. We're, we're linking sort of health type things to happiness and that sort of thing, but the literature on yeah. stress 
strongly suggest that it's if you're in a stressful environment but the big factor is if you can't control your stress That's it can right. be an incredibly high stress environment but if you're controlling it uh, yeah. in some ways and you manage it you're fine it's and and i think that can cause reverse causality that we have to just acknowledge i don't think there's much we can do about it you're right that, that's where these little, these smaller longitudinal studies come into play. They found that's one of the big findings. It's your adaptation. It's not the amount of calamity that comes across your path in life. It's how you deal with things. So that's Professor McDonald. Yeah. 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 Ye
decided to specialize in. Uh, you're right, I think any extreme pushing it too far would uh, destroy the benefits you get from uh, often two competing effects. And uh, your reward for effort has to be somehow acknowledged. And I think if you completely eliminate that, that's not a recipe for, for happiness either. Thank you. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for your question. <laughs> thanks for our blogger. It's great. <laughs> First time I've been blogged. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there is no paper yet. This was our kind of preliminary findings, but when I have one, I'll send it to Susan and the people want to download it. They are more than welcome. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Oh, thank you, thank you.